This chapter is vitally important for us, chapter 5 of Revelation, vitally important for us. We need to understand what's going on in heaven before we see the darkness that's on earth. It's wonderful to have this contrast of light and darkness, of the struggle and the pain and the um, tribulation on earth, the outpouring of God's wrath, but at the same time seeing the victory, the triumph, the glory and the beauty and the hope that fills the corridors of heaven. I'd like to bring all of this into context by just taking a few moments and reading chapters four and five through. I think it's good to review a little bit of what we did last week in chapter four by just reading it through here and reading these chapters together because we, of course, know that at one time there were no chapter divisions pre-1100s and, uh, of course, no verses until or the, um, around 1550. So um, it was all newer for the scriptures, relatively speaking. So starting with verse 1 of chapter 4, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne there were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him 
who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Praise God. That had to be the loudest Amen ever. <laughs> These four living creatures crying out, Amen. Boy, what a, uh, a loaded passage of Scripture. So we'll need to be careful this morning so we're not here all day. Not that that would be terrible, but we do get hungry. So <laughs> praise God. One thing I did want to note about the, um, to remind us that last week when we looked at chapter 4, we saw the emphasis on God as creator, the one seated upon the throne and the, the, the ones before the throne saying that he is worthy. They say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. So these living creatures who cry out, holy, 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 and the elders all fall down before God and worship him and say that he is worthy. I personally believe this is a refer reference to the triune God. I realize that in the next chapter, chapter 5, we see the lamb standing in the midst of the throne and we see him as clearly in chapter 5 as deity. Um, but just because we see this, this um, in a sense, if you could say, uniqueness of the lamb standing before the throne doesn't mean that that's the full revelation of who God is as we know Hear, O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one Father Son and Spirit are one and it's the one God who through whom all things were created and um, and I believe that's who is being worshiped in chapter 4 Chapter 5, we're going to see a unique worshiping of the Lamb. I was reminded as I was preparing this week of John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 29 and 35. In those verses, John the Baptist, when he first sees Jesus, when, he's with his, when, when John himself is with his disciples and he's baptizing and he sees Jesus coming, he says in verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In that context, when Jesus is just beginning his ministry, when he's incarnate, when he's walking around looking like a man under the inspiration and the power, he was a man, that's why he looked like a man, but what I meant is he wasn't yet glorified, he simply looked like another man like anybody else. And uh, i got to clarify that. Um, he didn't just seem to be a man, he really was a man. There was an early church heresy, docetism, which taught that it's, he only seemed to be a man because he couldn't really have taken on humanity because anything of the flesh of this world is evil and God would certainly never touch anything evil. And, um, and that, that heresy was called docetism or docetism. I've heard it pronounced both ways, so I'll cover my ground there <laughs> just in case. But anyways... Um, 
But no, he didn't seem to be. He truly was a man. But at this point, when John the Baptist sees him, he sees just another man walking toward him. But under the inspiration and the power of the Holy Spirit, John recognizes him and says he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I like this because, you know, there are some liberal scholars who have tried to say that the, that the uh, early church writers, uh, the, the apostles after the death of Christ and the early church, perhaps later on in the first century, tried to cover up for the death of their expected Messiah because he was dead and buried. And they, so what they did is they, is they said, well, he obviously isn't the king like he said he was. So what we'll do is we'll make this a whole spiritual thing and say that really what happened is he came to die for sins. But at the very, very beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ, He's declared to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if anybody would ever take, any of these scholars would take even a few moments to meditate on Isaiah chapter 5, which is one of the purest gospels you'll ever read, chapter 53. I don't know what I said, Isaiah chapter 53. It's, um, you know, 700 years before Christ, before anybody could manipulate the message or change it in any way, shape, or form, makes it very clear that he would be one who would suffer and die and pray for the transgressors, that he would be a lamb who would take away the sins of the world. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. We all were like sheep going astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isn't that interesting, the imagery of we were like sheep going astray, so God sends the lamb to take away the sin of the sheep. All of our iniquities were laid upon him, and that's a message 700 years before the incarnation. Praise God. So Jesus is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And after his resurrection, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And before I bring out a few points from chapter 5, of Revelation, let's remind ourselves of the exaltation of Christ. In chapter 2 of Philippians, you can turn there if you would like. You don't need to. You can just listen. But in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, we're reminded of the plan and the purpose of God and what he has accomplished in Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle says to the church in Philippi, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The glory of God the Father. Boy, if Jesus had that level of obedience even to death on the cross, boy, we should uh, have hearts that want to be obedient to, to the one who shed his blood for us. But we see in this fantastic passage of scripture, which is believed by many scholars to be a song of the early church, pre-70 AD, so it goes way back, 
So um, we see here that Jesus Christ empties himself, he humbles himself, he goes to the cross, he's resurrected, and he is exalted. He is exalted at the right hand of the Father because of his self-emptying, because of his coming as a servant, because of his death on the cross. He is therefore exalted. That's what the conjunction is there for. And it says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name and i think that brings some clarity to chapter 5 of revelation he um john the apostle says and i saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals and i saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. Documents at that time, it was, um, would have been sealed with seals. Um, actually, title deeds and inherit, inheritance titles were often sealed with seven seals. That does not mean that that's what this scroll is, an inheritance deed or a, um, or a title deed. I, some scholars have said, well, perhaps this is a title deed to the earth. Um, I don't believe that's what's happening because of the context. Because as the seals are being broken open, you see judgments. And, um, and then once the scroll has been opened, what you see is an outpouring of God's wrath. And you'll see an intensity as we go through the book of Revelation, because you have the seven seals. Then you have seven trumpet judgments, and then you see the seven vials of God's wrath. I believe there's an, an inherent difference in, in these. You'll see the escalating intensity and proportion of these plagues as Revelation goes on. The trumpets are significantly worse than the seals, and the vials are worse than both the trumpets and the seals. But the seals are not the content of the scroll because the scroll has not been opened until the seventh seal has been removed and then the scroll is open. I don't say this dogmatically, but I believe what, what we're seeing here in the nature of these seals is as we get into chapter six, you see that I believe what we're seeing is warfare, we're seeing death and famine, we're seeing things that are the consequence of man's sin. Yes, it's indeed judgment from the Lord, but remember, God orchestrates all things and he can judge through the wars that people have, through the struggles that people have, through famine he judges, as we see even in Egypt when God delivered the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He used a lot of those phenomena. What we're gonna see is more than just judgment as God opens, or um, as the trumpets sound and as the vials are poured out, we will see a direct, unquestionable outpouring of the wrath of God, even recognized by the nations at the time that clearly God's wrath is being poured out. And I believe that when we read these, we're gonna see that this will be an intense time period. I believe it is a literal time period and um, not, a, not historically carried out, though we see many similarities in history as well. But we will, we will see absolutely that the peoples, the earth dwellers, the people on earth do recognize that there is a God and that he's judging and that he's pouring out his wrath. And, um, and what we see is a, really a hardening, a resistance to this. They continue in their sin. I think part of what this book of Revelation will teach us is even with the apparent existence of God and his outpouring of wrath, people don't run to him for refuge. People become more rebellious and hateful. So that by the time you get to chapter 17, that the, that the beast and the 10 nations under his control 
all joined together to our, with all their armaments, if you will, to fight against the lamb directly. That's what it says in chapter 17. It's amazing. Kind of reminds me once again of chapter uh, excuse me, Psalm 2, how the nations gather together against the Lord and against his Christ. There's a rebellion against God. And I have to say this, even though today people deny the, um, the existence of God, really what's going on is they hate God. In fact, uh, we watched at our men's meeting the other night a a DVD, and it was the Doug Wilson's son, Nate Wilson. And he says, my dad likes to say, I, I forgot exactly how he said that, like there's two, two kinds of people in the world, or, or no, what atheists say. Atheists say, a, there's two things that are true about atheists. They say they don't believe in God, and they hate him. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, they, they think really that they don't believe in God, but I think if you read Romans chapter 1 very clearly, the atheism really is a moral issue. It's not a knowledge issue. It's a moral issue. When people refuse to believe God, they harden their hearts and they continue in their darkness. I think this is important for us to see because a lot of times we can get upset about, well, what about the innocent people in the world that have never heard the gospel? One of the things God does communicate to us is, well, two things in particular. One of them is there's no such thing as an innocent person, okay? The, the, the gospel message is very clear that we are, all, we are all inherently sinners, period. There's no such thing as an innocent person. Secondly, that one of the things the book of Revelation will show that even with the heavens opened, even with apparent wrath and judgment, and even in the presence of, think of the ministry of Jesus Christ, his powerful ministry where he was raising the dead and cleansing lepers and healing the sick. And it only hardened those who hated him and resisted him. Mercy and grace hardened some, softened others. And the judgments of God will do the same as we look at this time of tribulation. It softens some and people come to repentance but it hardens others. What we see, though, in these two chapters, and in particular in chapter 5, I believe from a historical standpoint, looks back to the past. It looks back to the throne of God at the very beginning of the church age. I say that because what's, what we're seeing is the establishment of the authority of of the Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And the Lamb of God is already here triumphant, and God is handing to Jesus. The Lamb takes the scroll out of his hand. The, 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 the Father God is delivering to Jesus all authority to judge, to save and to bring the great redemptive purposes of God to their full consummation. So what we have throughout history and what we have in the final consummation of all things in the great tribulation and second coming of Christ is not Jesus coming to conquer because he has already conquered. That's the message of these chapters. He has already conquered. He is just unfolding the purposes of God and bringing all things under his lordship and bringing to full consummation all the redemptive purposes of God. We live in a period of time when the lamb has triumphed, period. There's not this war of equals going on in the world, evil against good, the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. No, it's the kingdom of light under the authority of the triumphant and conquering lamb who is, who is going, which is going forward and destroying the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of darkness tries to resist. Is that clear? I think that's why we need to 
to understand these two chapters and what we need to understand about their placement here at the beginning of the book of Revelation. The triumph in the heavens is shown us first. And people, that's where our eyes need to be when we're in the midst of hardship, persecution, or struggle. We need to have eyes to see the triumph of the slaughtered lamb. That's so vitally important for us. In a way, the book of Revelation is a book of martyrdom. It's a book for martyrs and those facing martyrdom. So, who is worthy? There's only one, so you can eliminate yourself. <laughs> None of us are worthy. No one is, but you know the lamb is. And this one, this lamb, is, looks like a slaughtered lamb because he did it for you and me. We're, no, we're not worthy, but he is the conqueror. He's the worthy one who rescues and saves us. If anybody ever says, I'm not worthy, you say, absolutely right. None of us are worthy, but he is. I can remember a number of years ago in Dousman, um, preaching a sermon, and I remember getting up to the, the podium, and, and I looked out at the people. There's probably about 70 people in the group. And I said, let's pray. And so I bowed my head to pray, and I said to the Lord, man, I'm not worthy to bring this gospel. Like, who am I, you know? And, um, and the devil always remind, will always ask you that question anyways, who are you? But I think there was a very sincere question within myself, you know, who am I? I'm not worthy. And so clearly, so clearly as if the Lord were just standing right behind me, he says, and neither are they worthy to receive it. <laughs> That's the whole thing. None of us are. We're not worthy to receive it. We're not worthy to deliver it. But God has called us and he enables us in his spirit to proclaim his gospel. What a blessing to be able to tell somebody else the gospel, to tell somebody else, behold the lamb. What a privilege, praise God. So the lamb, um, excuse me, so I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look in it. When it mentions the heavens, the earth and under the earth, it's not trying to teach us anything about how the early the people at that time period broke up the whole heaven, earth and under the earth thing. It's just, it was just a language, um, an idiom, if you will. Um, trying to explain everywhere. There's nobody worthy anywhere. No matter where you go, there's nobody worthy. And I began to weep loudly. Some translations will say he wept and wept and wept. Others will say he wept bitterly. You need to put all these words together because it's the strongest word used in the New Testament for weeping. This is loud lamentation because the impact has hit the Apostle John of how horrible it would be if the world continued on in its present course. And there was nobody to redeem. There was nobody to bring God's redemptive plan to its completion. Otherwise, it's like we're all lost. What does the world, what does the future look like apart from God's saving grace? John weeps bitterly because nobody is found worthy. I believe this scroll really is, um, if, especially when you compare it to the scroll in Ezekiel and what we see in its context here in Revelation, it's an unfolding of the judgments of God whereby he will accomplish his salvation through judgment to his glory. That's bottom line what Revelation is all about. The salvation of God. God is glorified in salvation through judgment. And these purposes cannot be consummated. John, the imp, for whatever reason in his sovereignty, God lets the impact of that reality hit the Apostle John. Wow. And he weeps and weeps bitterly. 
over that. And then the elder, I don't know how long the elder waited, but the elder then said to him, um, weep no more, weep not. Behold, the Messiah, when he says the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. When he says that right away, the, the readers at this time period, as well as John, would have understood that as Messiah, the Lion of Judah, and that comes from the imagery in Genesis 49, the Root of David. What's interesting is why does it say the Root of David? You know, isn't that an interesting uh, phrase, something used in the Old Testament? Remember, at the time of 586 B.C., the kings of Judah were cut off. Now, God promised that there would always be a king of the line of Judah that would reign forever and ever and ever. But now the kings are cut off. And I like the imagery of the root because if you see a tree cut down, it's gone. And it, that's what it looked like. They, they had no king for 400 some years. You know, they had no king more than that. 500 some years. <laughs> and so, you know, it looks like, well, the tree's cut off, and where's the promises? Where's the Davidic dynasty that was supposed to be here, where the Messiah was to come from? Well, God kept the root alive, and from there comes the King, the Messiah, Jesus. God's promise continued to live during the Babylonian captivity of 70 years and during those 400 years of total silence when no prophet spoke until John the Baptist came, God's promise was kept alive. There was a root that stayed alive. Nobody could see the tree anymore, but the root was alive. And then this elder is saying, behold, here he is. The lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David. He has overcome. He has prevailed. He has conquered. And so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Otherwise, he can consummate all of God's redemptive plans for humanity in general, for the, all of creation, and for us as individuals. Behold the one. And for you and me, if I can bring application right away before I finish explaining the, ver the text, for you and me, what this means, when we look at this scene that God in his grace has allowed us to see through the written word, when we see this scene, what we're seeing is, behold the one who will consummate God's redemption for you and for me. Yes, for mankind. Yes, for the earth. Yes, for the Jewish people. Yes, for all the nations of the world. For the whole universe. But for you and me personally, Lord, am I ever going to be there? Oh, he's the one that will get you there. He's the one. Behold the consummator of God's plan. Boy, is there great security in that. Praise God. So he's told this lion, this conquering lion, and you, there was in many different Jewish writings at this time period, the idea that Messiah would be like a lion, coming once again from the Genesis account, but he would be like a conquering lion. And so John is anticipating this great conquering king, perhaps with all the Jewish nation at the time had expected in their Messiah, which is why they were disappointed in the crucifixion of this one, claimed to be the Messiah, who came in weakness and didn't come as that roaring lion to put down all the enemies of God. Instead, they saw a shamed, naked, bloodied, beaten, humiliated man dying, gasping for breath on the cross. And so, this is such an incredible ultimate irony as he's expecting the lion, the conquering lion to come out and he says, in between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. Hallelujah. 
I remember at the, um, they did not bring this out in the movie when they made a movie about the voyage of the Dawn Treader, C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. But in the book, it's made very clear. They've taken this, um, this ship and they've gone to the edge of the world. Their, their world is kind of like, it seems like it's flat. They don't you know, keep going around and around. They eventually come to the edge of the world where heaven meets earth. And they see, as they come up on the shore, they see the couple that went in there, and not all of them in, uh, from the ship, but a couple of them. I know Reaper Cheap was one of them. <laughs> but anyways, when they see this lamb in the thicket. And they, in making his little noise, and they notice the little lamb sitting there on the edge of heaven and earth, or the land of Narnia. And all of a sudden, the lamb turns into Aslan the lion. Magnificent portrayal, picture painted by C.S. Lewis. But what we're seeing here is incredibly amazing. The conquering king, how did the king conquer? You see, the message here in chapter 5 is not a king who's going to conquer. It's a king who has conquered. And how did he do it? A lamb standing as though it had been slain. Actually, the more literal translation of this word, the way the Holman translation brings it out is slaughtered. It's more, a little bit more harsh and gra graphic as well. And notice the one who looks like he was slaughtered is standing, so he's alive. It's the resurrection. He has seven horns with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. I know that this is kind of a weird imagery for us. The, the number seven is used consistently throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, there's like a list like this of how sevens are used, but seven is the number of perfection. Uh, we saw in chapter one, the seven spirits before the seven torches before the throne of God or the seven spirits of God. Um, yeah, seven spirits, I think the seven torches are gonna be here. But anyways, um, what we have is seven is the number of perfection. And so the seven eyes are perfect omniscience. You know what's interesting? Zechariah chapter four, verse 10, Old Testament, written 450 years approximately before Christ. Yahweh God, seated upon his throne, has seven eyes which go throughout the whole earth. And here we see the lamb, the same imagery of Yahweh God on the Lamb himself, a clear indication of his deity, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He has the fullness of the spirit. And the seven horns, horns in the Bible are symbolic of strength and authority. So all authority, power and strength are on the Lamb. He has all authority all power, all strength. He's also totally omniscient. He has all knowledge. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he has upon himself the fullness of the Spirit. And as John the Baptist says, it is he who will baptize you in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes from and through Jesus Christ. You know, people, there's, um, I'm going to just finish this paragraph and not the chapter. The reason I say that is I've already gone about almost 40 minutes, and I don't want to rush through the rest of the content here because it's too rich. But just to finish this paragraph, he sees the lamb. And, um, and he went, this lamb who looked as though he had been slaughtered, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying worthy, and I'm gonna stop with that word. 
Notice in chapter 4, before Yahweh God, the one seated upon the throne, they say, worthy. Now these living creatures who never cease crying, holy, holy, holy. You've got to get this image. These are exalted beings. They're powerful beyond belief. And they cry out day and night, holy, 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 before the throne of Almighty God. Now they fall down before the Lamb. And say, worthy. That's amazing. Heaven itself, and we'll see next week that all of creation itself ultimately bends its knee and worships the Lamb. This is powerful, powerful imagery. God has so engraced us, has so gifted us with his word. You know, when you see these truths, and I know I think of this once in a while, when I see awesome truths in the Word of God, and when the Holy Spirit takes those truths and gets your heart all excited about it, makes those things kind of real to you, you can see why, that's, why Satan has tried so desperately to keep the Word of God out of the churches. Like um, Brother Yoon, the heavenly man, said after all that time in China, and he comes to the United States for the very first time. He's probably in his 40s by now when he comes to the United States. He says, after traveling around to different churches, he says, Americans, the one, one thing he said about America is they have lots of Bibles, but their churches don't have the Word of God. And that's sad. Because they're preaching everything else, you know, but the Word of God. I think of liberal theology often and what people are being robbed of. They're being robbed of this vision, this beauty. What's interesting is he sees the lamb as though slaughtered. And I, I like to think of this imagery, and that was Kiwi saying goodbye to us, by the way, <laughs> that little bark. But I like to look at it like this. He is also the mediator between God and man. And I realize that this imagery is here for a purpose. Um, but we also understand Jesus not only to be the slaughtered lamb, resurrected now with the Father, exalted in glory. But we also know he's our high priest who ever lives to intercede for us. And, and so when I think of that imagery of Jesus praying that I, that I will be saved to the uttermost, completely and forever, that he's the high priest who pleads for me and prays for me. I like to think of him as the slaughtered lamb, that when, the, when he pleads my case, the father looks and sees the slaughtered lamb. What kind of accusation can Satan really bring against you when standing before the father is his own son, the lamb who has been slain and is resurrected and is worthy and has all power and all authority that even the great cherubim and seraphim and living creatures and all the redeemed and angels themselves fall down before him, just fall down prostrate before him. Praise God. And with that image of our king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, of the line of David, Therefore, Matthew's genealogy, chapter 1. This root of David, this lion, how did he overcome? He overcame by being the sacrificial lamb. And he, when was he the over, sacrificial lamb? 2,000 years ago, but in the mind, plan, and heart of God before the foundation of the world. But he was the sacrificial lamb, and that's how he overcame, which means he has overcome. It's done. When he said on the cross, it is finished, he meant it. And for you and me, because he has brought us to himself, because he has saved us by his grace, because he has united us to him, people, your salvation is finished. And we will see the unfolding of the full consummation of it because of him. Paul says in Ephesians that we've been sealed for the day of redemption. It's a done deal. Praise God. So with that imagery of the lamb, we'll, we're going to have our communion. And as we have the bread, 
as we have the juice. Try to hold that in your hand and if you will imagine what we've seen here, the lamb who was slain and look at those things and said, this is the guarantee that I'll stand before his throne blameless, not my own works and perfections, this. And say, God, I put all my trust in that sacrifice and I fall before the lamb and worship.